Hey everybody, there's this, um, I don't know if it was great, but it certainly stirred a lot of uh, thoughts in me and discussion in the comments. There was this tweet thread by someone who claims to be the spouse of a NASA flight controller. And on the topic of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and uh, Richard Branson all having space companies and Bezos going to be the first of the three to actually make it up, I don't know if he's actually going to low Earth orbit or if it's going to be a suborbital flight, but you know, he's going to be the first of the billionaires to actually climb on and go up. <laughs> and she writes the following. Sim Kern writes, if any of you are under the impression that our billionaires might succeed in escaping to space while the world burns, let me put those fears to rest with what I know from being the spouse of a NASA flight controller. For half a dozen people to exist up on the ISS, it takes a ground team of thousands of people constantly problem-solving how to keep them alive. Their quality of life is bouncing around in a narrow tube with the same five people who can't really bathe for months. Every minute of their day is micromanaged so they can survive. They follow strict exercise regimens to keep their bones from turning to goo. They spend a ton of time studying systems and conducting repairs on equipment that's continually breaking because space wants to kill you. Their sleeping situation is akin to a floating coffin. Their pooping situation is a 20-something step process in a porta potty where everything floats and the door is a plastic curtain. The Wi-Fi cuts out at regular intervals. The food is not Michelin-starred, to say the least. The only reason they're alive up there at all is because multiple countries have thousands of brilliant, highly trained engineers and doctors and astrophysicists and computer experts whose full-time job is keeping the astronauts alive and the ISS functioning. When something breaks, as it continually does, these teams scramble to devise fixes and solutions. These fixes, let me tell you, they are tedious. This year, working from home, I have seen the schematics and overheard bits of meetings, and oh my god, it is tedious. And the spacewalks, where they go out to repair these broken things? It takes dozens of hours of study to do each one, and then it's maybe four, six hours in a suit with stiff, bulky gloves, all drive bolt 7A into dock 31X until their fingers are shaking with exhaustion. So there's no future where Bezos and Branson are sipping champagne next to their space pool on low Earth Mar-a-Lago, okay? There's no way life in space could be remotely comfortable or preferable to life on Earth in their lifetimes, or for many generations to come, or probably ever. The longest anyone's lived in space was Scott Kelly, who spent a year in space, got home, and immediately retired. He'd spent all his life preparing and training to be in space, and found it extremely physically and psychologically grueling, to be up there for just one year. So this billionaire space race is nothing more than a dick measuring contest between Musk, Bezos, and Branson. They are not investing billions to forward science or the bounds of human possibility. They are doing it to be the first rich guy to bounce around uselessly up there. And it's utterly despicable when you understand that they're funding it with the hoarded wealth of workers who are struggling just to exist with ill-gotten money made from supply chains that enslave people and are destroying the future possibility of life on Earth. But if it troubles you that they might succeed, that these three assholes might ever spend more than a week in space and enjoy it, let me put your mind at ease. Not in this lifetime. With all their billions, they have no power to make space a better place to be than Earth. I don't know if they realize the futility, if they're aware that this whole space race is just a pissing contest to see who can get to zero G fastest. Or if being a billionaire makes you so delusional that they really think they can buy a Mars colony in their lifetimes. I don't know. Join me in enjoying the fact that they won't find anything up there but a lot of time to sit with the gaping void inside them, which space certainly won't fill, while forcibly holding their ass cheeks to a suctioning toilet seat because they're constipated as hell from astronaut food. The world is burning, and our billionaires are the people most responsible, but at least there's no escape for them. They will live and die alone, like all of us, on this beautiful, precious, one-in-a-gazillion planet. We should take our wealth back from them and use it better. So, clearly she's right about some stuff. 
she's right that space wants to kill you. Uh, space is not the place that our bodies are evolved to even survive, even for a moment, really. I mean, you could be exposed to vacuum, I guess, for half a minute, a minute maybe, and uh, survive. Not without injury, not without possibly life-changing injury. But that's not where we're evolved. We, we are part of this biosphere. This is where, you know, we are evolved to be a part of this ecosystem. That's where we are. I mean, that's... <laughs> Possibly we could create habitats in space in the long run, but yeah, in, in the short run, it takes enormous amounts of resources and expertise and human attention and effort to achieve what I like to call, you know, quoting uh, science fiction author Charles Strauss, canned apes. Our, our bodies require oxygen, they require water, they require food, they require macronutrients and micronutrients. They come from this place. We are part of this place. But robots work great in space. You know, the, the problem with robots is that they're rigid and they have trouble navigating chaotic, noisy environments full of unexpected, unanticipated, you know, unanticipatable contingencies and obstacles. And in space movies, you know, you can't uh, you can't throw a rock in space without <laughs> having other other rocks hit it, you know, or comets or, or something like. Space in movies is full of stuff, but space in reality is not full of stuff. It is as close to a perfect computer simulation, like a physics simulation, as you can get. There's just not much up there. So, robots, which are really good at doing doing things very precisely, doing, you know, replicating exact movements time and time again, you know, applying the exact amount of thrust for the exactly specified time. That's what robots do very well. So, you know, that's in my comment, I just said spaces for robots, canned apes are a waste of resources, build better robots. And that's, you know, that's what I think about space right now. I think there's enormous potential for humans in space, you know, in like human-built habitats, habitats that replicate our Earth-like environments. But that is, you know, beyond the engineering, just getting the biology of such a place right is incredibly difficult, as the example of Biosphere 2 demonstrated. You know, they, they didn't realize how much oxygen just the, the setting concrete in the base of the building would, would extract from the air. And they were left gasping for lack of oxygen, you know, inside that sealed building. And they had to cheat. They had to just open the airlock and let in more air. So, yeah, I think she's right that in the short term, and the short term being, you know, without radical life extension, within the lives of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, Richard Branson, yeah, there's not going to be, I mean, there's not going to be a time when anybody goes into space and has a better time in space than they're going to have on Earth. It's hard to be in space for canned apes. And canned apes are expensive. So, you know, build better robots. And we are building better robots. I mean, look at the evolution of the Mars rovers. You know, and you, you might say that the most recent two are just, you know, they, they use the exact same body style, the, the exact same chassis, you know, the basic design principles of, what was it, Curiosity? You know, of, of the most recent one, the one that's about the size of an SUV. Which to me says, you know, well, they've, they've got a workable design. So yeah, iterate. Do it again and again with minor changes now. Keep exploring, keep figuring stuff out. But there's no reason to send humans up there. In my opinion, I know some people are very passionate about having humans in space, but again, you know, most of the energy that you spend when you're sending humans into space is to send a bubble of passable, you know, Earth like conditions, passably Earth like conditions to surround them. And they still come back, you know, with their bones not turned to goo, as she said, but with a great loss of bone mass, muscle atrophy 
other, you know, cumulative physiological detriment and possibly cancer, depending on how long they're out there and how much radiation they're exposed to. But on the topic of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, their efforts being nothing but, you know, stroking their own egos. Well, sure, there's, there's clearly an element of that to it, but if you look at the statements these guys have been making forever, they, they really are passionate about space exploration. And, you know, their teams of engineers who design their rockets and who build them and, you know, do all the mission control, they're solving problems. And NASA has been underfunded for so long, they're so slow, they're so bureaucratic and so conservative. Yeah, they solve problems too, but they've been doing so at a much slower pace than SpaceX has been. And, you know, when these, these three men are gone, the expertise the, the problem-solving efforts that their teams engaged in and, you know, the, the wealth of knowledge that results from that. Check out this car. It's like an empty shell of a car. But all the things that they built will be in the toolkit, you know, for human space exploration going forward. So I'm really happy with, you know, the fact that these three men as opposed to most billionaires who really do just, you know, build big mansions and big yachts and f fleets of cars and, you know, just this pointless ego gratification. You know, at least these guys have ego gratification that has side benefits for the rest of us. And the amount of money that they're spending to get into space is still trivial compared to the amount of money that we all spend on trivial bullshit. I mean, compare, compare the NASA budget to what people spend collectively in the United States on cosmetics. It's trivial. It's a trivial amount of money. So the idea that working on space exploration is in any way depriving, you know, the funds needed to save the Earth is just stupid. That is just, I mean, talk about self-aggrandizing ego stroking. The, I'm going to save the world with my self-righteous tweet storm. Fucking, I'm more impressed by somebody who builds a rocket, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> you know, that's some egoic self-love that, uh, that I can respect. Now, this particular tweet storm, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, tweet essay. It's, it's just, it's remarkable to me that people use Twitter for this, this kind of communication. It's just not suited to it. But here I am discussing this series of tweets, so, you know, well done to, what's her name? I'll flash it up on screen here. It is the 3rd of July. I don't know if you're hearing fireworks. They're not, you know, a proper fireworks display, but just local recreational fireworks. Check out this park. Actually, this is a pretty cool park. All right. Well, <laughs> I guess I'll stop here. My last video was overly long. And this I've been jabbering for 10 minutes now, and uh, there's still a couple minutes of uh, tweet reading <laughs> to be added, so... What do you think? Are, are you righteously indignant about Jeff Bezos using his wealth to uh, develop a rocket that he's going to take into space? Does that offend your sensibilities? If so, let me know. Talk to you soon.